Welcome, everyone, to another broadcast of Unique, life starring you on the Artist First Radio Network. All past broadcasts are podcasts. You can find them at artistfirst.com. And now, here she is, your host, the lovely Susan Stackpole. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here on Why Unique, Life Starring You. We are what we are because of you, and we thank you for your excellent support. We have a special project we do here at Unique, and scientific studies are increasingly showing how our emotions and thoughts create a vibrational energy affecting us and our external world. And we just ask in keeping that in mind in the days and weeks ahead, you give yourself permission, just taking a couple moments and doing some deeply cleansing breaths, sending yourself and the world around you loving thoughts, doing even the briefest meditation and saying even the simplest prayers. And we believe that this blesses you and us and the world. And we're so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a really stellar guest with us today, and he just has some really empowering insight about how we can shift our perspective and have more awareness and live in a space of of possibility in creating our dreams and having beautiful living environment and the homes we desire and everything. And so I'll share more about him, and then we'll bring him in. His name is John W. Millette. And he's an excellent author, financial coach, housing industry expert, podcast host, and so very much more. His early childhood dwelling was in the projects and it fueled his determination, learning, and teaching key financial stability strategies. He has, during his two decades in home loans, personally originated over $1 billion, and that's B with a billion. And his higher education includes a Brigham Young University undergraduate degree and a University of Southern California MBA. John's inspiring book, Build Your First Home Today, is a comprehensive guide helping readers navigate today's hyper-competitive housing market. And his enlightening new podcast, Leaving Your Legacy Stories of Home Ownership, is inspiring people worldwide, empowering themselves. John's unique ability, simplifying financial awareness, empowers clients discovering how home ownership can be a positively transformative experience. Please, for more information, visit his website at www.johnwmallette.com. That's J-O-H-N-W-M-A-L-L-E-T-T dot com. John, thank you so much for your total awesomeness and just your willingness in sharing your life lessons and your present experiences and just empowering all of us succeeding. We're so grateful. And it's always just such a special honor and a treat connecting with you. Thank you so much. Oh, it's great to be here with you, Susan. I look forward to these calls. It it makes me want to be a better person so that I have something to talk about. (laughs) Oh. You know, this, uh, I, just, uh, I just love it. I really do. It makes me, uh, I prepare and I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to be uh, on your show and with your listeners today. Oh, well, we are so grateful, John. And it, again, it just is always a joy connecting and you're so inspiring. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, for anyone who who may just be joining us, John, you're so gracious as making multiple show appearances. And so we just encourage anyone listening, please visit the website and listening, the previous interviews, each conversation builds. And so just really, it allows us really going, uh, having deeper exploration of, of all these wonderfully insightful topics. And so John, for those who may just be meeting you the first time, Very briefly, can you share, how about this? Is there anything when you reflect back now? Because obviously you had multiple early experiences that not only were they not easy, they could have really made you bitter. And instead you've chosen to be a better person. Is there anything you can think now where maybe at the moment it didn't seem significant? And it activated something in you 
creating the life you have today instead of simply giving up? Because there were a lot of experiences you had where you could have just given up. And is there something maybe you can think of now, you didn't recognize it at the time, and it it shifted your life trajectory. Like it created the drive that you have today of continually bettering yourself and creating a beautiful life for you and your family. Well, I think that um, the the most challenging, um, I think the most challenging aspects for me when I was growing up is when they moved us into the projects, and and we had already moved like five or six times uh, up to that point within a six year period. Uh, my mother had been um, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And so I became kind of a quasi caregiver to her. And it really, you know, it, in that environment, in fact, when we moved into the project, I was so embarrassed that I didn't even allow my friends to come over for it would be at least six to eight months. And then even after that, I would be very hesitant to invite anybody over. And, and I think that, um, I think that that was really challenging for me. And the, the thing that I think made, because when you grow up in that environment, there's a really high tendency to continue in that environment, right? In other words, your life continues in there. There's a high probability that when people are in that environment, they stay in that environment for extended periods of time because they really don't know what else is available, what else is out there. And I think when I, when my, before my parents were divorced, we lived in a normal home and, and it's a home that my parents owned. And then the divorce happened when my father just decided to walk out on us because he was looking for greener pastures and uh, which in the end turned out to be to his demise. Uh, Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the aspect that I had that before so I knew that there was something that was a little bit different. And uh, also my faith, you know, my mother would, would drag me to church. I hated church. I hated everything about Sunday. And she would basically just drag me and say, you will come. And, um, and she always, you know, whenever I, I gave her a bad time about it, she'd look at me because she was pretty frail. And she was small and, you know, and uh, I was bigger and I was growing up, you know, this teenage adolescent. And um, she'd look at me and say, oh, so you're going to cop out. And I just I just hated that when she said that, you know, then I I grabbed my tie and put on my shirt and said, "Okay, we're going to go, you know, and she and whenever she she. Just brings back such emotion. Just think, thinking about that, that that when she would make that statement, it was like, no, I'm not copying out. And it was always a way that she would take me to a higher level. And mm-hmm. uh, I think that uh, having grown up with that, and then you know, when you go to church, you know, there's there's a higher probability that you're going to meet people that have regular families. And so I was exposed to the traditional family of what life could be. Um, not that not 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 that being in a divorce situation is a is necessarily a bad thing. It's just that I saw that there was a different life out there that I was not exposed to because when you spend that much time in an environment that's uh, very oppressive and And that's what I think is happening uh, today more than ever is it's it it kind of is an environment of scarcity, you know, an environment of fear to say, I'm not going to have enough money or I'm not going to have enough where you're always looking for more. And um, and I think that. That being able to expose myself to the fact that, hey, there is. A possibility. I didn't know quite what that was, but there is a possibility 
then that's c- kind of what gave me the idea of trying something new. And, um, and I think that that really created, I, I think that I got uh, into the habit of actually putting myself in a position that was um, uncomfortable. And um, I, I think the thing that really helped me the most during that time was not only my faith, but it was that I, I worked. That's one example that my father set for me was to work. And so at a very young age, I, I was selling Christmas cards door to door. And then, you know, so I could buy family gifts for Christmas for our families, for my, my, my um, mother and brothers and sisters. And then um, I started working at this camera store. And when I started at this camera store, I was a stock boy and I was responsible for cleaning and stocking shelves and sweeping floors and emptying trash cans and things like that. And I had this burning desire within me to start selling. And so I asked the owner, and I was 14 years old at the time, and I, could, and my, I couldn't even hardly, my, my chin uh, just barely came above the sales counter, right? And so, um, you know, with all the cameras and all the other stuff that was in those, those display cases, and uh, I said, hey, I want to sell. And the, and the owner looked at me and goes, no, you're a stock boy. You don't, stock boys don't sell. And um, wow. I remember that I was at work on a Saturday and they were shorthanded. It was about six to eight months into, into working there. And they were shorthanded because the guy didn't show up and we got really busy. And so they had no choice but to put me on the sales floor. And um, I started to sell. And, and to my surprise, I just blossomed with it and Mm. uh when my boss looked at me and saw me selling you know cameras that were four and five hundred dollars that time that was a lot of money for a single lens reflex type of camera um he he continued to let me sell and i sold and i developed a customer database and and really began to blossom with this idea of of um of of selling and um it created this idea that hey maybe i can make a difference maybe i can do something with my life and i think that um i even now have my a thought that i've been thinking a lot about and that is well what if i knew that people were going to listen to me you know what would i say how would I conduct my life? Because people really listen and they, they want to know how to be better. They just don't have the wherewithal to figure that out. And I think that's why coaching is such a big part of, of you know, what, what do you call it? Even couples going to couples therapy, you know, you can call it therapy, but it's coaching. It's it's being able to get insight into something that you don't know. And I think that I'm realizing the older I get, the less I know. And it's really humbling because it's an opportunity for me to say, okay, what do I need to do to advance my life forward? Mm-hmm. Wow. And such excellent insight. Such excellent insight. And and I appreciate you so much, so honestly sharing your experience, John. And maybe you could speak to the idea you're you've trained yourself essentially around reevaluating your perspective and having a possibility mindset. And so often there's people who have said that they've had experiences, maybe even they've had coaches and counselors, they've read books, they've attended workshops, and that they feel that sometimes not only nothing in their life changes, 
the opposite of what they're desiring is presenting itself. And they get mm. to a place of just resigning themselves and saying, well, I'm watching while all these other people are making the same effort and their lives are progressing. And I'm having the same disappointing and disheartening experiences. And a lot of times, even without realizing, they either completely give up uh, and or just even settle. And so what advice would you have for people who are listening and they're saying, well, that's great for you that you were able to turn things in a new direction and have all these positive experiences and I'm making all these efforts over here. And not only is it not manifesting, it seems like it's it's going in the opposite direction where there's even more disheartening experiences. And what advice would you have, John, for having more awareness about what can possibly shift? Well, I think that's a question where the, uh, where the rubber meets the road. I mean, that's really a, a big, uh, 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 a really important aspect. And I think there's a couple of things that go with that. The first one is uh, the environment that you are in. And even when people are in the most extreme negative environments, even prisoners of war, when they're in really a bad environment, they're still able to separate their 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 being, their actual consciousness, and say, "This is temporary." That's that's why um, you know Victor Frankl's um, uh, "Man's Search for Meaning" our mm-hmm. book, because it really focuses on the fact that that even though they had control over everything that he did, they still didn't have control over his mind. And he was conscious to that effect because uh, Eckhart Tolle talks about the power of now. He talks about the idea that when you become aware of consciousness, when you become aware that you can actually make a decision and that you're not part of your environment, that's when you really begin to um to really get an idea on what's going on. And that's why one of the, um, you know, I love the idea of a a TV show host that does travel tourism on a a show on Netflix when he talks about where your life begins, where your comfort zone ends. And I I had found that environment plays a big key to that. And that's why I'm such a proponent and so passionate about home ownership. You know, the thing that that is so important to understand is that when my parents were divorced, I would go visit my father and his second wife. And that was a horrible environment to be in. And I think that we don't really give credit to the fact that when we're, that the environment that we're in is a big deal. I mean, it is a huge deal of the environment that we're in and who we're hanging with. And even if we're in an environment we don't like that we're forced to be in, you still have the ability to have that consciousness to read books and to get an idea of really what's out there. One of the biggest challenges of people that are in poverty, as I was, as as my uh, mother and brothers and sisters were, is that generally speaking, they don't they don't travel out of 25 miles radius of where they live. Wow. And so the experience to be able to see that there's different a different world out there, and um, and it takes a lot of work, and that's why the idea of scarcity is so easy to fall into as a trap to say I want more, there's not enough. And Lynn Twist talks about this in her book called The Soul of Money that I just love, where it talks about the idea that there's scarcity, but there's also sufficiency, and sufficiency is not she doesn't define deficiency as a definition of minimum. She defines it as the power to draw on what's already there. And so I, I think a good example of that is when I was, I wanted to go to school, right? I wanted to go to college and most people um, thought that I, I, I couldn't do it. And um, by some, by some fluke, I got into, to, uh, to college. And um, um, and I remember that I had to support myself, 
right? My father was kind enough to pay for one semester in books. And I was, I was really surprised that he did that because seldom did he keep his word. But on this particular occasion, he did. And, and then I had to find a job. And so I went to this meeting about selling books door to door, children's books in the summertime to put myself through school. And because I'd had some sales experience, I thought, well, you know, I have to do this. So I'm going to do this. And so I remember they gave me a script and I went out and I knocked on doors and I began to memorize and give this script. And it turns out that the script didn't work very well. And so I thought, well, I really want to be uh, number one. I want to break the records. I want to figure it out. And so I had this experience where every time I would go in and I would give a presentation and I would lose the cell because I know that I couldn't be high pressure because they would just cancel. So I had to create an environment where they really wanted to buy what I had. So I had to really build the need. And Susan, it was really interesting because the first couple of weeks were so hard. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that when, when people show signs of success, they they forget about the fact that it was really difficult to get to that point for something. Now, some people are really easy. For me, it was really challenging. And so I had to, when I lost that cell, I'd go out to my car and I think about, okay, what did I do that I can do next time that's going to create a cell? And then I would go in and I would get past that one point where I lost the cell. And then there was another point where I lost the cell and then another point and then another point. And I would make changes and pretty soon, I was closing about 80 to 90% of my presentations because I had gone through the process of figuring out what it was and why I was losing the cell. It was my responsibility. I took the responsibility and I said, okay, what do I have to do so that people will genuinely want to buy my product? And it was painful to evaluate myself and say, this is where you failed. This is what you need to do better. And then once I had that down, then it opened up all these vistas. I began training people. I began helping people increase their sales. And, you know, it was, it was magnificent. It was amazing. And it came from the idea of saying, what do I have to do? And that's where the sufficiency comes in because we often have the resources already. We already have what we need. We already have the people around us that can help us. We already have that information. It's there. It's just a matter of drawing on it. Wow. That's so, it's such an excellent awareness, John, in terms of recognizing because so often we're conditioned I feel so much feeling like what it is we desire is out there the skill set is out there. it's another class it's another product it's another something else and without taking the time of really sitting with ourselves and activating the resources within us and the resources we already have. I feel like we're we're trained early on of this idea of always desiring something new, and that tends to drive us, I feel, overlooking what's already available for us. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally... And, you know, it's kind of... There's a great story in Lynn's uh, book, Soul of Money, that I think is so powerful, where she talks about she went out to because she was in the process of raising money to her, her goal in life is to end world hunger. And, and she, by golly, I mean, she is amazing. I mean, the amount of money that she's been able to raise to contribute to uh, countries one day, she'll be out in the desert. Another day she'll be in a lavish dinner with hosting, with raising money. I mean, she's just amazing. And she tells a story about that. The very, um, southernmost part of Africa, there is a, a desert. And she went out to these people in the desert. And these people were so far removed from civilization that the government didn't even recognize that they lived, that they were there. They didn't, they couldn't vote. They could, you know, the government just 
just said, we don't even recognize that these people exist. And the problem is, is that they were running out of water and they were in the desert and mm-hmm. the wells were drying up and they just, you know, they, they were, they, they, she went out there to say, well, what can we do? Do you, do we need to move your entire village or what has to happen? And, um, you know, as a Muslim, um, uh, Muslim, um, culture. And as a result, uh, when she got there, she was talking only to the mullah and the, and the, the mullahs and the men. And on the outside were the women. They were in a circle around the men and they were discussing. And she just had this impression that the women had something to say and that she needed to talk to them. And so she, she said, I want to talk to the women. And the mullahs, you know, after some deliberation, they said, okay. So she talked just to the women with a, a man that was a translator. And the women said, we know that there's water down there. We know that, that there is a lake down there and we want to dig. But our, the men in the village will not let us dig because that's not what we're supposed to do in life. We're not supposed to be diggers. We're supposed to be more of taking care of the home and the children and cooking and farming and things like that. And so she just and, and they said, we know that it's there. We've had dreams about it. And we know that the water is there. And so she, after deliberation with the mullahs and the men, they agreed to let the women dig. <laughs> and so they had very rudimentary um, equipment and they dug and they dug some more and they continued to dig. And it took about a year. And at the end of a year, they found water. And that water was amazing because it was able to uh, produce enough for uh, to create 10 to 17 villages. Uh, the women became part of the council. I mean, it was amazing what transformed just because they had a gut feeling, they had an instinct that they followed, and they took action on it. And there's a there's a a great book um, by uh, Anna Goldstein, and it talks about be bold, a guide to unbreakable confidence. And she talks about the idea that you really have to take action. You have to you have to move out of the light into a a form of darkness that says I have to try this. I just have to try it. And and people will give especially in the places like the projects, you know, it's kind of like, no, you know, you're like, you're like the crabs. I mean, crabs are really interesting the way crabs work. You can, you can, you never have to put a lid on a container that has crabs. And uh, the reason why you never have to do that, if you're out in the ocean and you're collecting crabs for food, you know, fishermen, they never have to put lids on them because as the crab is crawling up the side of this container, the other crabs will automatically pull that crab down. And Mm -hmm. as a result, they never get out of the container, even when the lid is off. And so much we are in in environments where people are saying, no, you can't do this. Even though you have an inspiration, you have an instinct, you have God-given or universe-given powers in you that say, I can do this. Somebody is saying, no, you can't. And and we buy into that. And that's why, um, uh, you know, the last time we talked a little bit about this idea of taking cold showers. I, you know, I read a book by Wim Hof called The Wim Hof Method about, you know, cold therapy and how it helps uh, your body rejuvenate and how you can swim in water that's 40 degrees and you can actually hike in your swimsuit in very inclement weather and um, that you can maintain your body temperature and you can actually have that kind of control. And I thought, boy, that sounds great. I'm going to, I'm going to go to this seminar someday. I have an intention for that. And then I closed the book and then something said, no, John, you need to look at this more. How are you going to prepare? And so I did more studies and, and they said, well, you got to prepare by taking cold showers. And I said, absolutely not. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. I mean, I used to make it so that when I got up in the morning, 
I showered before all our kids did, so I would have all the hot water. And I didn't yeah. care if nobody else had hot water after that. I had to have hot water. I had this belief, this system in me that said, you have to have a hot shower, otherwise you're not going to take one. <laughs> I mean, it was really to the point where it was it, it ridiculous. And so when it came up to me and said, no, start taking cold showers, I thought, that's stupid. That's ridiculous. And then one day I was in the shower and something said, try it. And so I, you know, I, I was on hot and I put it on full cold and it was like five seconds. That's all I could do. And then the next time it was six seconds. And then the next time it was six seconds. And then the next time it was three seconds. And then the next time it was seven seconds. And then pretty soon I got up to 30 seconds. They tell you if you can do it for 30 seconds, your body will become more immune to disease. And then I, I started starting it cold to start with, not all the way cold, but cold. And then I would, and then at the end, put it on full cold for at least four or five minutes. And wow. now I'm at where, you know, and so, so this, this idea, this just by taking cold showers has just expanded my thinking and, the, and, and it's been kind of brutal, Susan. It's been really, <clears throat> it's been <clears throat> a bit difficult because I have had to ask myself, well, what other things have I conned myself into believing? What other lies? Because scarcity is a lie. What other lies have I been thinking about or that I've been paying attention to or that I've been following that aren't, that aren't, that are lies? What have I conned myself into believing that really uh, are lies? And it's had me, it's had this uh, experience of reflecting on say, well, wait a minute. If I can take a cold shower when I thought that I would never be able to do that, then maybe I can do something else. And it always starts small. It's always small. It's always something that is, you know, when I'm selling books, you know, the thought came and we will, John, you don't know anything about raising kids. So why don't you tell stories about parents who use these books to teach their kids values and tell it from their point of view? And so I started doing that. And then all of a sudden, my, my closing rate just rocketed. And so all of these things come from a very small, minute thing that we don't give it much credit for. Jack Canfield calls it little whirlwinds that come, that come across, you know, that come across and you think about and they present themselves. And a lot of times we don't do anything about it, even though there's such a small idea. And it creates, it can create an amazing result, but we have to have faith. And what I've learned is I have to have faith in that small little idea. And, and then, and then as Anna talks about, uh, Anna Goldstein talks about, then we really have to take action. It's action. No matter what the circumstances are, whether you want to read a book, whether you want to then start with one paragraph. I mean, uh, you know, it's all perception. Maxwell Maltz on a book called Cyber Cybernetics um, talked about the idea where your perception is everything because your body reacts to the perception. And he gave an example that if, if I were to dress up as a bear and and I was in the wilderness and we were on a hike and I was the bear and I showed myself to you and you believed, you believed I was a bear, your body would react to that even though it's not a real bear. And, and I would eventually take my head off and show you it's me. But your reaction would be as if I was really a bear when that is not the case. Now, obviously, when you're out at Yosemite or wherever you might be and there's a bear, then you better get out of there or not even go there to begin with. But the idea that perception is what drives our behavior. Perception drives everything. And if our perception is one of scarcity and lack, then that's where we're going to be. That's the state of mind that we're going to be. If it's sufficiency, if it's the idea that Lynn brings out that we have enough, more than enough, where all of a sudden these women get around and say, hey, we think there's water down there, but we need to dig for it. Well, 
they took action and they did it. And it's these small, imperceptible ideas that is so important to pay attention to. And again, that's what comes back to environment environment, hanging out with the people, because you'll never get better than the people you're hanging with. And and that's why I'm so adamant about this idea of home ownership, because it creates an environment that can help you move forward. Now that's not to say that that you're that you're a bad person if you're renting. That's not the message. The message is is that the more you take action into your own hands about the environment that you're in, the more you'll be able to move your life forward, if if, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like what you're saying, too, is so key in so often because of our thought process, without even realizing we disempower ourselves, right? That maybe there's something that people have desired, including owning a home for a long time. And because the thought process, exactly what you're saying about perspective, because the thought process may be, oh, that's not ever going to be possible. Maybe somebody along the way said, oh, because of your financial situation, you're not going to be able to do it. And so they took that idea as being true. And so now, exactly like the example you gave with the crabs, right, is that, um, and then there's other examples, too, where they've talked about in nature, where it's that animals will indoctrinate each other, that if one of them has an experience that they cannot do something or there's an unfavorable consequence, then they'll, uh, they'll warn the other animals, they'll stop the other animals from making the same attempt doing the, the same thing, right? And so exactly. often tend to do that, right? If we've had especially a massively disappointing experience, maybe it's even an experience where it was something beyond our control and it's involving somebody else. And maybe it's requiring some forgiveness on our our part, right? That there's something that if we go within ourselves and do some exploration, we can sh- make, a, make a shift. Right. And a lot Times too, what it requires is stepping into a new version of ourselves. And for some people, that is really unsettling. They're like, well, I know, even though I feel really unhappy where I am right now, there's a sense of certainty, right? That I I know that I'm going to wake up every day and I'm just going to feel disappointed in life instead of expanding the the comfort zone, right? And having this willingness of saying, well, maybe something else is possible. Right. And so, right. right. And, yeah. and especially they're talking about things like depression and anxiety and everything are so prevalent today. What, what is something small that people can do if they just, John, if they're in a position where they just feel completely stuck, whether mm-hmm. it's saying, Oh gosh, I would really desire owning my own home. And it just seems like that's completely impossible now. Or maybe it's, you know, having healthier, lifestyle, maybe it's improving their relationships, maybe it's a new career where they just feel like, well, okay, I there I don't really have any available resources. I believe in this idea of sufficiency and at the same time I just am examining my life and I just feel like this is as good as it's gonna get. Yeah, and I think that there's two aspects to it. I think it's the idea of of your of your intention. So there's a, a a a concept that that when you begin to put an intention out there and you speak because that's what humans can do that other animals or other mammals can't do we can speak and so we can actually project into the future and call into existence an intention that does not exist at that time and I'll give you an example. There was a, a study done by Harvard Housing Studies, and it was a study that was done from 1999 to 2009. And even though the study is a few years old, it has massive lessons. What they did was is that they said, okay, we're going to examine people who rent what their median net wealth is versus people who intend to buy. It didn't even measure at the beginning of the study those who already owned a home, it was just those individuals that had the intention to buy a home. 
That's all it was. It was just that. It was just either you're renting with no intention to buy or you're renting with the intention to buy. That was the study. Now, it expanded on that, and I'll explain that in a minute. But, but the, the beginnings of it just said, okay, what is the difference? And they found that the difference is, is that the median net wealth of a renter that had no intention to buy was $1,500. But the median net wealth of the renter that intended to buy was $8,100. Now, in today's money, that doesn't seem like a big deal. But the magnitude of that is five and a half. It's a 500% increase. I mean, it is massive when you talk about the difference between that amount, those two amounts of money. And they found that that because there was that intention, because they called into existence something that didn't exist, all of a sudden they begin to buy less coffee and they save more money. And all of a sudden when they voice the fact that, hey, we're going to buy a home, then parents would say, well, we've got a little bit of extra cash or aunts or uncles, you know, that, that had some income would come into existence and they would say, you know, we're going to, we're going to help you with this. And then other people would say, well, maybe we can help you co-sign. You know, we have a client that, that had no idea of, of buying a home and, and it was Father's Day and they said, Hey, let's just go out and look and dream a little bit and see what it's like. And so they came in an open house and one of my, uh, one of my team members was, was there and gave him my book on, uh, buy your first home today. And so as he read the book, he said, I never realized that it might be a possibility. And we've been working with him now and his girlfriend uh, and his mom for the last eight months. And they are now almost ready to buy their first home. And the mother said, you know what? I'll move in with you. They are uh, a tight knit family. And miracles have happened and I see it all the time. Susan, I see it all the time when mm-hmm. people don't have a prayer in the world of ever qualifying, when they put that intention out there and they commit to it and say, you know, it's a small, I mean, it's a, it's a big thing to do it, but it's just a, an idea. All it is is an idea and all of it, you know, and then pretty soon they start putting that water on cold for just a few seconds and they try it and they say, well, well, what would it look like if we really did buy? And that's why, I have a real concern for um, uh, people of color because the rate of home ownership for them is the same as it was in 1968 when the equal housing laws came into existence. And uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about that. Uh, and it's, and a lot of it is based on the fact that they grow up and I've done, we've done a lot of research on this. They, they grow up, uh, the the child who grows up in a rental versus grown up in a home that's bought, uh, uh, studies show that there's an 8 to 15% greater likelihood that those who grow up in a home that's bought will buy a home. And the reason is really clear, because when you're renting, as I was in the projects for so long, most of my teenage life, you know, you can't put a hole in the wall because we're not going to get our deposit back. Well, just when when my when my mom would say that, it was like, Oh, so I'm not really in a stable environment. Or when somebody says, you know, the toilet is uh, broken, the landlord's too cheap to fix it, so we have to fix it. Or we have to move because the rent is going up. Whatever it might be, it's an entirely different existence than when you're in a situation where your, your, your dad or mom says, well, what color do you want your room painted? I mean, it's a totally different existence growing up. And, and so... That's why a study was done uh, by Fannie Mae many years ago that showed that 45% of people who rent think that they had to have 20% down. So if they're going to buy a $300,000 home, um, that means they got to come up with $60,000. Well, the well, game's over. You're, you, that's not going to happen. But when it's only 3%, which is really true, you know, then I got to come up with 9,000. Well, I can figure that out. And I can get a roommate to buy with me. I can get my parents. I can... I can figure this out. And it's this myth busting. It's the idea that myths are so powerful. It's that bear that comes to you that's not a bear. You only mm. perceive. 
Wow. And that's so significant. You're, I, I feel like if you ask most people, they, they would agree that they would say, well, yes, like absolutely. Like the minimum, it's going to be 10% that that's right. And people have had experiences where someone told them that. So now they believe that instead of saying, well, what if that's, what if that's not true? What if there's somebody who is like you that would be willing to work with them and help them achieve this goal? And one of the things I feel about you, John, that's so inspirational is your ability transcending some of your early life experiences where for some people, what what would happen is that that would inform their sense of self-worth. And so while they would say, oh, I have these dreams and these goals and these desires, right? Even what you were mentioning, which it's an unbelievable statistic about with people of color and that the level of home ownership not really changing, that often sometimes it can even be generational, right? That, That people will uh, people's parents will behave a certain way. They'll have certain money philosophies, all that sort of thing that just get indoctrinated without even realizing. And a lot of times fuels people's mm, motivation or not having motivation is feeling like, well, maybe I'm, life has shown me really that I'm not worthy of having a better quality life. And you seem like you've been able to somehow transcend that or heal that within yourself. And so what advice would you have for people who are saying, wow, I'm having this realization that part of the reason I've been settling in my life is I just, I don't really feel worthy of something better. Well, you know, I think that, I think the best uh, example of that is um, interviews that we did with the um, with uh, uh, people of color, African American uh, community, and we reached out and we actually did interviews with um, with a lot of different individuals and families. And there was one case that was very interesting, and that is is that. Um, when this individual was speaking, he was an older individual and he said, when I came into the world, my parents were sharecroppers and they were barely getting by and, you know, they, they would get some profit, but then things would be tough. And then somehow my parents got some other jobs and they began to work and What happened is, is that they decided that they would buy a home. And back at that time period, it was very difficult for um, uh, African American to buy a home because we they had they had these zones where they were excluded, where they they couldn't buy them. And so, but this one builder said, "No, I want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to buy a home." And so. This builder made it so that they bought the house, but they didn't buy the land, which made it affordable so that they could actually do it. But they still had to have a lot. They still had to work. And the the thing that was so interesting on this, Susan, is, is that they had to buy a house way out kind of in the sticks because that's all they could afford. And the challenge was, is how were they going to get their kids to go to the school that they wanted their kids to go to? Because they really felt that environment and schooling was such a big deal. And so they decided, they said, okay, son, we live an hour and a half away from where you're going to go to school. You're going to get up at 530 in the morning. You're going to walk a couple of miles. You're going to take the bus. You're going to ride it for at least an hour. And you're going to go to school. And then you're going to come home and you're going to repeat it the next day. And they said, you're going to go to a school that we, that we know that has a great environment. And then I got to talking to him a little bit more and I said, well, what, what is your profession now? Well, it turns out he was a PhD teaching on a collegiate level. And it was because his parents insisted that he have the right environment, even when they were poor as dirt, even when things weren't going well. They said, you will 
be in an environment that we want you to be in. And, uh, and, and that doesn't mean, you know, not, and I understand that not everybody can do that, but they can begin to move towards that. There was a, a, a physical therapist that talked about the idea that, you know, when you do physical therapy, they'll give you an hour worth of stuff to do. And he got so frustrated because no one ever, no one ever did it and they didn't get well, their, their bodies didn't heal. And then he started saying, just, just jog in place for 30 seconds in front of the TV. Can you do that? That was his prescription. And then they said, yes, I can do that. So they started doing that. And then it went to a minute and then it went to five minutes. And then pretty soon it ended up to be an hour. And his parents got well, or his patients got well. And, you know, it seems so simple, but it seems so hard. And that's where you're either of the mindset of scarcity or your sufficiency, where you believe that somehow, some way, you can bring this into existence. Mm. One of the things is your, Shan, thank you for that excellent insight, John. One of the things that comes to mind, especially in the example you were just sharing, but both the examples you were just sharing, is first what you were saying about giving people saying, well, can you jog 30 minutes and then maybe a couple minutes and then working up to an hour, similar to what you were saying about the, the, the cold, right? And mm-hmm. just really training yourself. We're, we're trained in such a way of not acknowledging progress when, it, when we haven't fulfilled our goal, right? There tends to be this disregard of the process when we're on our way in between where we are now and where we desire being. And one of the takeaways I feel from what you're saying is recognizing the progress, right? It may not appear the way that we think. And, and because oftentimes that will encourage us. A lot of times what's discouraging is saying, well, nothing's happening and I'm not really achieving anything and my goal isn't manifesting. And we're not recognizing that like, well, two weeks ago, we weren't even taking any action. And now this week we are taking action, even if it's just what you were saying about just taking a couple seconds, 30 seconds, five minutes, whatever it is. right? And I think there's something so important about that. And then also what you were sharing in the example about the gentleman with the PhD and his parents being determined of him having the proper environment, which today now, especially with education, with having internet access and things like that, we, we can learn anything. And so what what can we do? And one of the things about you is that you have set a higher standard for yourself in terms of continuing learning and growing and creating new projects and things like that. What is something that people can do today to take one step toward having a better life experience and encouraging themselves in the process, especially when it feels like nothing significant is happening. Yeah. Um, there's, um, a, there's a book that I've read and, and I, I, I can't remember the author's name, um, but it's, uh, it's about habits and it's about it's habits. No, it's not Atomic Habit. It's a, it's another book by an author that's just amazing. And uh, he, he talks about the, the concept that just focus on one habit and to be accountable to somebody for that habit, for the creation of that. Just one. Because when you do one, then it spreads and ripples to everything else. And it comes with the idea mm-hmm. of having intention, setting the goal, telling somebody that you will do it so that you're accountable to it and then, and then do it. And if you fail, then that's okay. Try again. I mean, the, the whole idea of see, setting goals or setting intentions is a really scary process. 
It's scary because it means that when you start to set an intention or a goal, that means that you can fail, right? If you don't set goals, you don't fail. But if you set goals and you say, hey, I'm going to be the crab that crawls out of this container no matter what, <laughs> you know, you're, you, there's a lot of, you know, gravity is really against you, right? Because everybody else is saying, no, you can't do it. It's like the book by, you know, on, on the, uh, Jonathan Livingston Seagull about the seagull that um, says, no, you know, I can do more. And, and so you become accountable to it and you do one, just one go, one intention and then see that through. And then all of a sudden, cause I, I, I have that. I am uh, starting right now with a gal that I am giving my goals to, and I will become accountable to those goals. I, I do not move my life forward unless I have somebody to be accountable to. I mean, it, 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 it has never failed. When I don't do that, I don't move forward. When I'm accountable to somebody where I have to make a report, then I can move forward. And that's why it's so critical to find people that, that I trust and that I want to hang with and that I want to be with and have the experience of saying, okay, I set this goal and I made this goal. And it may be really small, getting up in the morning, going to bed at night, eating right, or whatever it might be, just something begins to give you confidence that, yes, I can do that. And that's where um, Anna Goldstein talks about just taking action, even though it's a horrible day. I mean, you know, if I'm having a horrible day and, and, and a deal didn't come in or whatever it was and people saying, how was your day? You know, I say today is a fantastic day because we're helping so many people, you know, learn about that they really buy homes or, you, you know, it's always the idea of, of putting sufficiency out there and that one little thing. And that's what really what I'm, I'm on my next journey, my next journey that I'm doing, uh, working on right now is high accountability. And we're going to start with small goals. And that when I've had high accountability in the past, I mean, that's how I got my book done. It was, it was the high accountability for my mentor, Scott Cody. So there's so much opportunity out there. There's so much that we already have within us. It's just waking up. And that's, again, that comes back to the cold showers. I decided I wanted to wake my life up. I wanted to wake up and be a real human, a real man, a real somebody that people could count on. And I'm still in that process. I'm not, <clears throat> this is a journey. This is a, this is not a destination. This is something that I'm still working on. And I work on it every day. And other people, it comes a lot easier than it does for me. And I have to get rid of, and I still have these, these myths that come back from my childhood and these experience that I've had and, and fear, um, dominated so much of my life that I have to replace that with no, there's sufficiency. There's, there's hope. There's ability. There's something already there that can make this happen and I can create it. I can draw forth from the universe and say, I, I will do this. Mm. What I really like about what you're sharing, John, is your honesty and what you just expressed about consciously choosing empowering thoughts and the idea that it's not innate, it's not organic for you, that it's a conscious choice. And that's so significant. And I really appreciate you sharing your journey and, and being so honest and saying that, no, it's not something that it's natural, that it's a daily process and it's, it's a conscious choice. And so just really, really excellent awareness. And I also like what you were sharing about this idea of like awakening your life right and 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 making the making the choice and the high accountability all really really excellent life principles and uh, just uh, so many more questions john and not enough time if people are wanting to connect a desire and connecting with you what's the best way they can reach you and how can you help them well um call me on my cell phone 
Yeah, I'll give you my personal number. It's 805-432-2382. You can call me directly. Um, and I'll be glad to uh, help in any way that I can. I, you know, I, I, what I do is I transform, I help people transform their lives through home ownership and, um, also will provide, um, you know, coaching and, uh, um, life principles and, and help them in any way that we can. And, you know, that's really what we're all about is drawing out from individuals who they really are. And, and a lot of times that's been overlayered with so much fear and doubt and miss and misperception that people forget about it. And uh, what we want to do is we want to help people bring that out and say, no, all of that, who are you really? And, and, and that you're a child of the universe and that you have amazing potential and possibilities. And it's unlimited possibilities. Hmm. I like that so much. And as we conclude, John, is there something for you? Maybe it's a recent lesson. Maybe it's something a mentor shared with you that is now a guiding life principle. Yeah, I think that, um, again, my work with uh, my mentor, Scott Cody, I think that uh, the most important thing that I can do in my life is take action, is to be present. See, when you when you don't have scarcity, then you don't have fear. And when you have sufficiency, as Lynn Twist talks about, then you're in the present. There was a there was a study done at Stanford that that took children who love to draw. And they just drew. And then they, they did a study where they gave the children gold stars. They gave them rewards. And they come to find out that there was the, the amount of art that these kids did decreased because they didn't get the stars as much. And the idea is when you put effort in, you put effort at that point in the present. Enjoy your efforts that you're putting in currently. So when I make calls to clients, I am present and I am enjoying that call and um, not always looking for more, being present and saying, I have, I have what I have, what I need, I have, and we can make this hack and make this happen. Oh, brilliant. Really, really brilliant. Oh, my goodness. It's always such a genuine joy connecting with you, John. And you're such a genuine inspiration in terms of your own motivation and all the fantastic ways you're expanding and growing your own life and really walking the talk. So just thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your excellence in inspiring us, expanding our comfort zone and recognizing what is really possible. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're so welcome, Susan. I'm so grateful for you. Oh, well, that's absolutely mutual. Absolutely mutual. And, and grateful for your listeners. I really wish them the very best and, and, and phenomenal blessings to them. Oh, really, really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for joining us. You're such an excellent guest. And thank you, listeners, for joining us here on Why O Unique Life Starring You. Please remember, be kind, be love, be true, and most importantly, be you. 